How's it going, everyone? My name is Neil. I'm uh, one of the cardiology fellows at MGH. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about antiplatelet considerations, cardiogenic shock. I'm going to start off with a case. And it's going to be interactive. So if any of you have the app, you can uh, answer the poll questions from the app, I'm told. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I have no relevant disclosures. So we're going to kick it off with this case of a 75-year-old gentleman uh, with history of CAD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who basically came into the ED with substernal chest pressure. Um, he was in his usual state of health. It's about 4.30 p.m. that day when he developed hand tingling, lightheadedness, substernal chest pressure, similar to his prior MI, uh, while taking out the trash. Um, and so he took an aspirin 325, called EMS, who gave him an additional aspirin 325 and some nitro spray and brought him into the MGH ED. It's a pretty classic story. In terms of rounding out his past medical history, um, he had a STEMI back in 2008. So this is from early 2019, so about 11 years prior. Uh, and he's gotten a PCI to his RCA in that setting. And then he also has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he's on aspirin 325 daily, uh, metoprolol, uh, succinate 37.5 daily, provostatin, and he's a never smoker. So in terms of his initial exam and, uh, and labs on presentation, so his vitals actually weren't so bad. His heart rate 62, blood pressure 123 over 76. He's satting well. He's in some mild distress from the chest pain, but otherwise his exam's pretty unremarkable. His, uh, no new murmurs, lungs are clear, uh, no edema. And his labs uh, are actually pretty normal as well. His creatinine is 1.23. We didn't have any priors. He had no prior data for him in our system. Um, and then his high sensitivity of troponin was actually normal, which is nine. Uh, and this is just because he presented so quickly afterwards. Um, this lab was drawn within 30 minutes of symptom, on, symptom onset. And his NT-Pro BNP was also normal at 143. So overall, pretty unremarkable initial presentation in the ED. Uh, however, this was his EKG. Um, and here you can see there's a left bundle. Um, there is a, you know, a one millimeter ST elevation AVL and then some Concord and SC depressions um, and, two and a, uh, three in AVF. And uh, we didn't have any prior EKGs in our system we did have a report of a prior EKG in our Epic uh, Care Everywhere, which did not report a left bundle as of at least three months prior. So presumably a new left bundle in the setting of chest pain and these depressions that are concordant uh, prompted the ED to essentially get, activate the cath lab. So we had eight out of 10 chest pain in the ED. Um, the ED actually gave him some morphine for this. Um, and then he got heparin bolus and drip and then the cath lab was activated pretty quickly. So uh, this is going to be our first uh, case question. Let's see if I can click on this link. Is there some way I could click on this link? Assuming this is not a touch screen here. No. Nope. Maybe you guys can click on the back for us on, on the link. All righty. So the question here is, which antiplatelet would you administer at this time? And if this link doesn't work, we'll just do a show of hands. Um, all right, I guess it's not going to work. So, all right, so let's raise your hand if you think clopidogrel 600 is the way to go here. Okay. Clopidogrel 300? Okay. Uh, TICAG 180? Okay, yeah, fair amount of the room. Okay. And then prazogrel 60? Okay, a few prazogrel. Okay. And then a no additional antiplatelet at this time in the ED? Anyone? Okay, Dr. Bot and a few others. All right. So in our ED, uh, we actually didn't administer, they did not administer any additional antiplatelet. And again, this is a, a cultural practice of MGH uh, based on the surgeon's preferences if someone were to go into cardiac surgery afterwards and how the, the culture of the ED is. So I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but this is what happened. Um, so no additional antiplatelet, P2I12 was administered at this time. And this will impact what happens later on in the case. So this is the initial diagnostic angiogram. So the patient's taken quickly to the cath lab. And here you can see um, in the this is sort of the right, you can see some distal, uh, like a 90% uh, PDA and POV lesions. Um, and then we looked over to the left. Okay, here's the left. And here you can see the LED is occluded osteally. So osteal LED occlusion, and then some 50% CERC disease. And again, the previous slide, you did have some 50% ISR in the right. Um, and so just the, the, uh, the diagnostic angiogram we ended up calling um, oh, this is an older version of slides, but um, the, uh, the LAD was osteo-occluded. We had, didn't, they didn't end up poboing it and getting um, distally. There's some multiple 50% lesions. There's a large D1 with some aneurysm and tortuosity. And the RCA had some 50% mild uh, mid uh, stent ISR, some PDA stenosis, and PLB stenosis. So uh, in terms of 
this next step. So let's say you have this anatomy on the coronary angiogram, uh, and he has not gotten a P2Y12 inhibitor. Which uh, antiplatelet would you administer at this time? So I'm assuming this link's not going to work. So raise your hand if you think clopidogrel 600. Anyone? Okay, clopidogrel 300. Okay, TICAG 180, if you had not gotten it at this time. Okay, a number of people. Uh, Prazogrel 60. Okay, a few. Oh, okay, a few. And then a kangaroo lure infusion. Okay, Grabat and a few others. All right, so not many people participated, but it sounds like a, a scatter, scattering of, of TICAG and, and kangaroo lore was, was the sort of gist here. Um, and so we chose a kangaroo lore infusion. This is primarily because we saw that it was you know, multi-vessel disease, possibly surgical anatomy, uh, and a, a, a more uh, a, a non-IV uh, P2Y12 inhibitor may take a longer time if, um, to wash out. So the cath lab course, just to kind of summarize, so access via the left radial artery, the patient had diagnostic angiogram, the kangalor infusion was started as soon as this was known, um, and then this osteo-LED lesion was pobid with a 2 balloon, but there's only TIMI-1 flow, and at this point, the pressure started dropping a little bit, and so the patient started a norepinephrine at 20, and it came up to as high as 45 during the case, um, and unfortunately, uh, they were unable to deliver a balloon um, in the LAD distal to the diag, so then in MCAT microcatheter was used to switch the workhost wire for a wiggle wire. A Sapphire 1 0 balloon was initially used, and then a 2 0 and a 2 5 non cutting balloons ultimately get TME 3 flow in this, um, in this LAD. Uh, and then an IVIS in this LAD showed diffuse proximal and mid vessel disease. Uh, and so at this stage, uh, a balloon pump was placed in the right femoral artery. Uh, the right heart cath um, showed a wedge of 24 and an index of 2.22 on a balloon pump and a uh, norepi of 20. Um, and then CT surgery was consulted and patients transferred to CCU to await cabbage. Uh, and this is just a post-PCI uh, coronary angiogram. So this is after the initial POBA, what, uh, what the LAD looked like. Um, and then after the uh, microcath and uncutting balloons, the end of the case, um, this is sort of the LAD. So it did look better, but again, multivessel disease, so the patients transferred to the CCU uh, on Kangalore. So the clinical course, he actually um, uh, became chest pain-free in the CCUs. Uh, norepi was down to eight. Uh, and he was on heparin and kangalore drips, and the, the norepi was actually weaned off for the next few hours, and the patient's diuresis with Lasix to get a wedge to less than 18, and an echo was obtained, which showed an EF at 34%, with the inferior wall being preserved, but um, uh, the anterior wall being down. And then um, the drip was actually, the kangalore drip was actually continued, and the balloon pump remained in place until the patient had a cabbage, uh, which ended up happening three days later, and he ended up getting a five-vessel cabbage. He was transferred out of, uh, out of the ICU on post-op day two, and actually discharged to rehab and post-op day six. So overall, that's the clinical case here. I'd like to acknowledge Darshan Doshi, who's uh, the primary attending on the case. All right. Great. So it is a tight session, but maybe one question. I think uh, what this illustrates really is, you know, do you load these patients? Is the load going to do you harm in terms of waiting for cabbage or not? I think at our institution, they've been comfortable with Plavix loading, but, and they initially said they'd be okay with Brillanta loading but then they've been a little bit more reluctant lately. So like, it, it adds into the issue of um, making that decision right off, the, right off the get go. This patient looked like by EKG that it wasn't multi-vessel disease. It looked more like uh, the right was probably okay, um, which it was. Um, and the LED was the, pro you know, Prox LED was the problem. So I think at our institution, we may have given uh, Berlinta to this patient and then, um, but it, uh, and then see the evolution at that point. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're following the guidelines or your surgeons are, you can't really blame them because even with clopidogrel, the guidelines and package insert would still say to wait five days with uh, clopidogrel or, or with uh, ticaglor for that matter, seven with prasugrel. So, um, you know, it's, it's not that the surgeons are wrong for doing that. In fact, they're, they're being evidence-based when they're doing it. Well, I think they've been going right away if it's a load. So I think obviously the guidelines were based on the um, uh, studies, cure studies, one of them showing that it took five days, um, but that wasn't uh, particularly just patients who just got the load. So I think they've been more comfortable with the load going straight to the OR, but Berlinta, I think they were more concerned about because they do recognize more bleeding with Berlinta if they go urgently to the, lab, to the OR. Yeah. 